I think in a lot of ways, um, testosterone gets a, a bad rap because mm -hmm. people think that it works just on the sex organs. Right. We've got androgen receptors throughout our body. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to your bones, your muscles, your kidneys, your liver, your skin, um, your brain. So what they find is like, for example, elderly people, it's not going to make a person a genius or somebody who's demented, but it will help who make, make them get better again completely. But it will help certain things that's been documented. The ability to spatially recognize different things. There's certain that it's a clarity that can happen. So it's, I'm not saying that all people in, in convalescent homes should be put on testosterone, but it's something to consider that testosterone itself affects all of the organs of the body. Welcome to the Maximus Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Cam Sapa. As a clinical psychologist, medical school professor, and CEO, I specialize in helping men be better in mind, body, and masculinity. On this podcast, I interview extraordinary men as a clinician would, hearing their come up stories of how they became the men that they are today, and having them share their secrets of actionable advice on how to look, feel, and perform your best. All right, welcome everyone. Very excited to have a new episode of the Maximus podcast. Today we have uh, our esteemed guest, Dr. Wayne Hellstrom, who is a professor of urology and chief of andrology, which refers to male infertility and sexual dysfunction at the Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans, where he's been since 1988. His practice is specialized in the diagnosis and treatment of sexual dysfunction, including Peyronie's disease, surgical and vascular reconstruction, prosthetic surgery, male infertility, uh, BPH and urethral structural disease. He is a clinician, author, lecturer, and has published uh, many peer-reviewed articles in professional publications and numerous chapters in textbooks. He's also the editor of Male Infertility and Sexual Dysfunction and a Handbook of Sexual Dysfunction. Dr. Hellstrom earned his undergraduate medical degrees at McGill University in Montreal, completed his urology residency at the U University of California, San Francisco, where I'm a, I'm a professor and his fellowship at the University of California at Davis. He's been awarded uh, many honors in the field of urology, male infertility, and erectile dysfunction. And we're very pleased to also have him as a medical advisor to Maximus. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hellstrom. Wonderful to be here, Cam. Nice to meet you too for the first time in, in person. Yeah, we've, we've talked several times on the phone and over email. So it's always good to, to do this face-to-face -face with the magic of Zoom technology. Um, wonderful. I would love to just start out and hear your story about how you got interested in, um, you know, urology, men's health, and sexual medicine. Well, it was a natural. I guess when I was a intern, I took care of um, during my general surgery rotation, young boys, and I used to do cut downs on the surgery service because they were they had leukemia or lymphoma, and I'd go home feel very uncomfortable at night. And it just veered to me that I loved reproduction and I loved, uh, I guess, all the good things in life. And as a urologist, I veered to an area that uh, provided that. So I help couples have babies. I help men make love. I help men feel good about themselves. I fix urethral strictures and I do reconstructive surgery when it comes to Peyronie's disease. So all the things I really like doing and I go home and I say the vast majority of my patients are very happy. So mm -hmm. it's something that directed me. People have to do other things in medicine and sometimes they are unpleasant, but they do it as a calling. Mm -hmm. I found my little niche. And I've been happy here ever since. Amazing. Um, and I noticed that you're, you're chief of andrology and andrology is kind of an interesting Feel because it's, it's not a specialty in and of itself. Sometimes it seems like a lot of urologists or endocrinologists, uh, different sort of specialties end up doing it. I'm kind of curious how you see sort of the evolution of, of andrology and, and edu medical education around it. Well, it was a natural when you think about women when they have obstetrics and gynecology. So people specialize in that area. You go back to the 1950s. It was surgery and OBGYN. Those are the two special, those are the two sort of divisions that developed before we became, you know, ultra specialized in different areas like ENT or pulmon, uh, pulmonary surgery or cardiovascular things. But uh, it was a natural that, um, that uh, I'm losing my thought train here. But uh, when it came to uh, gynecology, gyna stands for women and ology study of, and andros is 
men or ma male, and that's a study of the male. So I guess basically we're a little behind when it comes to the study of male. And this is an area that deals just with men and a lot of the issues. Of course, there's a crossover for the females that are involved with men. But for example, if men develop sexual dysfunction, be it a hormone deficiency or their erections don't work, or they have Peyronie's disease, that this is an area that some of us have specialized in. And uh, it's basically been growing. So we have the American Society of Andrology, and obviously it involves reproduction. And Sexual Medicine Society in North America deals with more of the sexual issues, but this is very academic. They're not, uh, a lot of these things are peer reviewed and high grade journals that uh, things are published in. And it's a very exciting area because it's opening up and we're learning a lot about transgender medicine. We're learning about um, uh, couples medicine. So it's evolving. The journals are wonderful. It's very exciting. So it's nice to be at the early part of uh, men's health or andrology is another term for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's fantastic that you're involved in the, the research and the education around that certainly uh, needed. And it's certainly, I think, uh, having a renaissance, if you will, in terms of consumer interest uh, in it. You know, I think so much of um, uh, patients sort of uh, interaction with the healthcare system is only when they're sick, or there's obviously an acute uh, sort of problem. Um, and maybe a lot of things that people chalked up, you know, if they had sort of poor libido, for instance, they just assume was sort of the natural cause of aging as opposed to something that could be improved. Um, so I, I think it's a really important field. Uh, for... I think one of the things is if you look at the early part of the 20th century, the average um, individual male lived to about uh, 37 or I think maybe 45 years, 50 years old. And then over the last hundred years or so, men are now living to about 76, women up to 80. So this whole group of uh, geriatric medicine or elderly medicine has sort of evolved. Now, a lot of the, what people were old when they were 65, about 30 years ago, but now many people are in their 75s, 80s are considered to be a new age right now. And mm -hmm. many people are actually um, knowledgeable and they read about themselves and they're taking right. basically uh, the bull by the horns and they wanna learn about it. So they read a lot on internet which provides that for them and they do a lot of questioning. So that's how probably they come and intersect with your company Maximus because they want to learn more about themselves and they want basically quality of life. And uh, I think that's what they're searching for. Absolutely. And I think that's quality of life is uh, just as important, if not much more so than quantity of life. Uh, yes. And we're talking about health span uh, beyond just lifespan. Um, speaking of which, uh, I'm curious, how did, how did you, um, I know I think we obviously reached out to you, but I'm curious why you decided to become an advisor to Maximus. Well, I think that the pandemic and the, uh, I guess, Generation X and the um, new generation of people are very much into telemedicine and learning about things. And I'm traditionally, I teach in lecture halls and in the operating room. But basically, you can reach a lot of people. And I really enjoy dealing with young people and learning about the new ways that people get information. And um, I think I just wanted to be abreast and uh, basically try to reach other people. I obviously know a lot having done this for almost 35 years, but it's a different modality in dealing with people. So, like, for example, I would be doing a lecture to a few hundred people right now, but potentially because there's no time constraints, somebody can watch what I'm going to talk about today with you or some other experts going to talk with you at their own choice and possibly learn a lot from these things. So it's just amazing what we can do with technology and uh, what we can do with uh, as we're doing right now. Absolutely. And yeah, it's a, a privilege to have you as one of our advisors, uh, along with the other half dozen uh, professors of urology and andrology that we have on our medical advisory board. And, and I very much agree. I mean, I, I've sort of shifted my entire practice to telemedicine. Um, you know, on the psychology, psychiatry sort of side of things. Um, but it's interesting to see more and more specialties, uh, at least at least the non-procedural or surgical ones where we can do that. Well, I will say one other thing is that as a caveat, um, there's nothing wrong with a face-to-face -face visit with a uh, physician. And cool. sometimes subjects or patients take it upon themselves to, for example, self-prescribe um, something like, let's say, a PD-5 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. where they think this, they want to help their erections. But the uh, fact that a man in his 40s may lose his erections may be like the canary in the coal mine. There may be something else there. So you want to have an astute clinician or physician ask certain questions. And you can do it by telemedicine, but sometimes the face-to-face -face involves a physical examination where you pick sure. things up. So um, 
I wouldn't throw out face-to-face uh, -face medicine as we know it in the past and the, uh, the touch aspect of it, but there's no question when you can do things online uh, and people don't have to waste their time in traffic jams or parking and waiting in waiting rooms, uh, it makes a lot of sense that probably a significant amount of medical care can be done over by telemedicine. Absolutely. And I see it as a compliment as well. I'm, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about your own practice, particularly the non-procedural, non-surgical patients. Why do people come see you? What, what kind of cases do you treat? And have you noticed any sort of trends in terms of, you know, changing, uh, uh, you know, increasing conditions that you're, you're, you're noticing or treating? Well, one of the areas, just as an example, it, all this is going so quickly, but um, one of the areas I love reconstruction, I love microsurgery. Um, Peroni's disease was a very unusual condition where men would come in with all kinds of uh, physical distortions of the penis and they lose their erections. And um, over the years, we started looking at primarily the treatment for that was surgical and all the oral drugs basically didn't work. And they still don't work. But we worked on a couple of different agents and I did work with uh, a couple of companies and uh, the current product, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the collagenase that's available, you'll see it advertised on many of the, uh, at the football games or on, on, the, on the weekly papers. Uh, Zyaflex is the other name for the commercial mm -hmm. name. But that all evolved from early research that we did on uh, men with this and looking if we could in interlesionally inject an agent that would dissolve scar tissue. And this is basically FDA approved, but it involved basic research. Likewise, the PD-5 inhibitors, the agents you commonly know are Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. All this started from initial work where we would do penile prostheses and take a little tissue and we would do uh, muscle bath studies on these tissues. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the surprising thing is that we always think of muscle that's in the penis, believe it or not, mm -hmm. that when you stimulate it, it contracts. In the penis, it's the opposite. When you stimulate it, it relaxes. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we found was that we gave certain agents that relax the muscle, men would get erections. So initially, this was with a injectable agent that caused a vasoactive reaction that the blood vessels and the muscle would relax. And eventually, we found there was a selective oral agent, and it's Sidenafil, mm -hmm. uh, first thing is Viagra. And this was an after loan reduction agent that they were initially studying to help men with heart failure. That's right. In the initial studies, these men would come back and they wouldn't return their unused uh, uh, pills that were given to them. And what it was that they got better erections and prolonged erections, not something like prolonged erection like priapism, but this right. was a good thing. And it was written as an adverse event. Mm -hmm. So it took about three or four years. They caught on to this, that this might be something good. And this is how things at serendipity that patients discovered that uh, th this and, and the researchers didn't recognize initially what they had, but after a realization that a lot of these patients didn't want to return their study drugs, right. that they looked into this. And this is the evolution of this very selective agent. Likewise, there's other central agents that we're looking at right now that may have effects on erections. And an area that's opening up is female sexual dysfunction. And female mm -hmm. sexual dysfunction has trailed male studies by about 20 years, yeah, but yeah. they're evolving. And the reason is that men have penises. When they get erections, we can look at them and measure them and look at the blood flow. Penises, when it comes to the vagina or the clitoris, it's more internal. So it's not something you can obviously look at, but we're learning more and more over time. And that's a parallel. So they've actually had uh, an agent or two that's been in, uh, introduced into the, into the marketplace for female sexual dysfunction, like male sexual dysfunction. So all these areas are just evolving over time. And I think one of the agents that we had worked on were for premature ejaculation. This is a common problem um, right. that men have, and there are certain agents that we develop, are developing and have developed that can help men. So this is a quality of life issue. So it's not necessarily like you were saying before, quantity. You don't want to live to 90 years old and basically walk with a cane. Mm -hmm. You want to have very fruitful years when you're young and vigorous and, and don't want things to pull, pull you back. So I think this is what sexual medicine and men's health is all about. Absolutely. Let's dig into some of those because I think those sure. are interesting, exciting areas and, and people would love to understand more. 
Um, so why don't we start with the PDE5 inhibitors? You mentioned three of them. Uh, uh, There's a fourth one too, Avanafil. That's another one, but it's a fast acting PDE5 inhibitor. But those are the four main ones that we all know about. Can you, so can you talk about the differences um, between them? I, I know they're used for different use cases. Um, and also just kind of the pros and cons, because interestingly, there was an article in New Yorker about, you know, one of the big telemedicine companies and the u- ubiquitousness of PD-5 inhibitors, especially in young men who may not sort of meet the traditional diagnostic criteria for ED, uh, but obviously a lot of younger folks are using them as well. Well, th- that crosses over to something else. A lot of younger men, basically, they start dating and they start having sexual activity and they're very anxious, and the psychology of it can inhibit a lot of people. Just knowing they have a potential pill can be very beneficial to patients. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of, because I'm in a college town, have young patients coming to me, and they wanna be prescribed this, they don't need it. It's not gonna, if a person is basically doesn't have any deficiency or any kind of comorbidity, it's not gonna make any difference. It's not gonna make them a Superman. But we learned from our studies that 30% of men, there's a placebo effect. Just have taking a pill, even with a sugar pill, when it comes to sexual aspects of a relationship, improve. So maybe in the United States, we're just uh, like Alice in Wonderland. We like taking pills, but we believe that this might help us. So we get a better response. So uh, whenever you do a good study that's basically designed well, you always want to have a placebo arm. And we've learned this in in sexual medicine very forcefully. So with the initial initial PDE5 inhibitor studies, what we found was there was probably a 70% beneficial response in the treatment group and up to a 25-30% response in the and placebo arms. Mm-hmm. So that's very important to know that uh, just going and talking to a doctor or taking a pill can be very beneficial to patients right. in these areas. Now, of course, if you have some deficiency that's organic based, and if you can provide an agent that, that o- so overcomes whatever is going wrong with every your metabolic abnormality or your, mm-hmm. your basically your enzymes aren't working properly, that's of course will work. But I'm saying is that when you take younger people who probably don't need these agents, I would attribute the benefit, the psychological aspect more than a actual organic component. Yeah, absolutely. And as, as someone who's my, my background in mind body medicine, it's certainly, you know, uh, belief is self-fulfilling prophecy for a lot of folks to, uh, with the placebo effect. Um, so can you break down the four different uh, sort of main PD-5 inhibitor? Okay, well, the, the, the common ones that we know about was uh, the first one was Viagra. Mm-hmm. And that's a agent that you don't want to take with a, uh, a fatty meal because it inhibits the absorption of the agent. You take it a couple of hours before sexual activity. There are certain contraindications that patients take are taking uh, uh, agents that cause uh, nitrate, nitrate agents that cause, can cause profound loss of blood pressure. Mm-hmm. And they did have a few deaths initially. So um, mm-hmm. any kind of nitric oxide, any, uh, any agent that lowers the blood pressure like this can compound and make this a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some people that do have some side effects. Now, it's very interesting because the efficacy of these drugs continue and the side effects seem to attenuate if you take them. And common things would be headache. Right. Uh, some patients may get a flushing of their face. And mind you that I know some couples that the wife would tell me that, you know, I can see that his, uh, his face is turning a little flushed and I know the agent's working. So that's when I start having sexual activity. So that's sort of a sign, you know, you learn from these things. Uh, some people can get GI upset where they get reflux and uh, some men with the Viagra agent get a blue hue. It's not dangerous. It just hits different, uh, the uh, PD-6 uh, enzyme in the eye, in the retina, and it causes a little bit of a blue tinge for a few hours. Mm-hmm. Now, the PD-5 inhibitors, uh, Viagra or sildenafil is, is, is the uh, generic term, lasts for about six or eight hours. So you can strategically take this. Levitra is very similar to, uh, and it was designed for this, to the Viagra agent. Um, but the Real different agent is Tadalafil, and this is an agent that doesn't have any kind of food hindrance, Mm -hmm. and it has a long period of action. So you can take it, and it'll last for 24 to 36 hours. Mm -hmm. And in France, when it first came out, it was called the weekend pill because men would take it on Friday afternoon, and basically it would be good till Sunday night. So, um, And it basically doesn't have the food food intolerance. Uh, An interesting 
uh, side learnings from using uh, Tadalafil or the uh, Cialis mm -hmm. is that it does seem to help men with uh, lower urinary tract symptoms from BPH or irritable okay. bladders. So what now we've done is that men who have uh, urinary complaints, we can put them on a low dose daily Cialis, that's five milligrams rather than the full dose 20 milligrams and take this daily. And it will help urinary symptoms, but it'll also benefit men um, with uh, uh, ED issues. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a commonality between those two diagnoses. Right. And what I do in some men that don't respond to PD-5 inhibitors or did respond, but now as they're aging and their comorbidities, diabetes or cardiovascular disease or hypertension is progressing, so they're getting atherosclerosis, is that I put them on daily Cialis and I give them basically a, I admit they, they take a prescription of um, Viagra, 100 milligrams a couple hours before, and I get about 30, 40% improved response. So it's a combination sometimes that helps. It doesn't make any sense really, but it does seem to work in some of these older people. And otherwise they have to go on to more aggressive, uh, uh, more invasive types of uh, options when it comes to it. The fourth agent is an, anaf an anaphyl, and it has the least probably side effects and it's the fastest acting agent. Um, it's not that commonly prescribed right now, but it was, uh, it's a fourth agent that has been used. Other countries, especially Korea, for example, have some other different agents that are available, um, but they all basically work on the same principle. They inhibit of all the PD, uh, the phosphodesterase enzymes, there's 11 or 13 of them in the family, mm -hmm. but the number five is uh, principally located in the cavernosal tissue of the penis. And that's why it selectively works. So it's a really a marvel of medicine that we right. can actually take a pill that works in one area. And if you had asked me 10 years before the entry of this, actually, I was invited uh, mm -hmm. by the people from Pfizer to go one of the AUA meetings. And I was in a closed room with three or four people and they presented their data from uh, the sandwich studies, England, that is with these men who didn't return their, their prod, their, their study pills. Yeah. And I was a disbeliever. I said, this can't be possible. You take a pill and all of a sudden you're going to get erections after. That was like sort of the, uh, the, the kind of like uh, allure that you would hear right. uh, of all these magical witch doctors. So I was just, I didn't believe it. And sure enough, it was true. So I became a believer after I saw patients who responded and changed their lives. Absolutely. Yeah, there seems to be an increasing interest in the sort of low dose daily Tadalafil usage that you mentioned. We actually had Dr. Eugene Shippen, another one of our advisors on the podcast, and he was almost um, describing uh, anti-aging benefits of it in terms of, you mentioned the, the improvement in BPH uh, reduction in hypertension uh, or blood pressure that, that comes along with that. Interestingly, there seems to be some studies that are emerging in terms of improving muscle protein synthesis. Uh, the, the vasodilator, the dilating yeah. sort of effects, um, you know, are often used by, you know, athletes uh, in order to improve their, their performance in the gym. Um, so I was, I'm just curious if you've sort of seen or, or heard anything about. So the, where I would use it is not for athletes in that circumstance, but where I would use it is after surgery. Sometimes mm. um, I want to improve the blood supply because blood supply brings in nutrients and growth factors into that area. So I do think that it does have a benefit when I put them on low dose PD-5 inhibitors after. And traditionally, after men have radical prostates, uh, there's a period of time before their nerves come back to working because they've been stretched during the procedure or they may, whatever they have while they're recovering. So the smooth muscle in the penis basically is not active. And if it's not active, it becomes fibrotic and it becomes atrophic. By putting in a PD-5 inhibitor, you increase the blood supply and it seems to uh, rejuvenate the muscle to a certain extent. And that's the concept. And we did that in a lot of rat experiments and showed that it worked. It doesn't seem to work as well in humans, but it, as far as uh, preventative, uh, preventative uh, method, as I was mentioning before, but it will help men get erections, no question. So from a yeah. psychological standpoint, those men that do respond to PD-5 inhibitors after that type of procedure will benefit from these agents. But I will say that after reconstructive procedures, when I do Peroni disease, in order to improve the blood supply, a low dose like dead allophil would be very beneficial for these guys. That's, that's a very interesting use case. Um, have you seen any of the studies on the hormonal effects as well? I, I've seen some, some indications that it could potentially uh, increase testosterone just a little bit um, uh, as well. Well, uh, I haven't really. No, I don't. I don't uh, think that's the case. This agent works on a different. If patients are emotionally uh, benefited, then I think there may be a, a, 
potential benefit to these guys that feel so much better. They have good erections. You can imagine a guy that hasn't had a morning erection in five years and all of a sudden has one uh, that he feels wonderful. He feels mm-hmm. like five years younger or 10 years younger, something like he feels like a young kid. So this in itself will probably work onto the whole hormonal axis and cause mm-hmm. um, testosterone to rise a little bit. He's happier. The world's happier because he's happier. So um, I think that's the benefit from it. Uh, but as far as working on the hormone system, I'm not aware of any um, direct studies on different uh, enzyme levels that this would work at. Fair enough. You also mentioned sort of central acting agents uh, for sexual health. Um, are these like oxytocin or dopamine agonists or, or what are yeah, they referring to? There are those kind of agents here and some of them they're in their infancy. And the problem is that they're located very close to the um, areas that cause nausea and vomiting sometimes. Mm-hmm. So these men will get erections and they sometimes will lose their lower their blood pressure, um, but they will have this nauseated fine. And for example, when we did with the uh, uh, agents that we were looking at for premature ejaculation, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of these agents actually work, but uh, guys would tell me, they said, the yeah, agent was fabulous, but I just feel nauseated. I don't want him to have sex now but because I don't feel very good. So it's something where we have to probably get a more selective type of agent, and they're working on these areas. And obviously, the central nervous system is an, a difficult area to, to work on, but it'll be little incremental changes or, 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 or steps, just like how we found with uh, the PD-5 inhibitor with uh, Viagra, how it worked. We looked at something else that I think we'll learn about these things. Um, so it's not something that'll happen overnight, but over years of research and understanding and, and learning things. And as I was mentioning before, unfortunately, I think you need to do studies where you have a control group because mm-hmm. the power of suggestion is so in, 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 imprinted in, in, in humans so that if uh, they read something, they may believe it and it almost becomes true. And that's why you, not only do you have to have a placebo arm, but basically a interval of time to see if there is true benefit, let's say after a durability, like after a year, they're still getting these same benefits. And that's great when we do find these things, but that's how yeah. science comes from. We, 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 we have these hypotheses, we test them. Some are true, some aren't true, and that's okay, but that's how we make progress. Absolutely. Have you, have you um, have any familiarity with um, sort of the use of these dopamine agonists, such as um, apomorphine or cabergoline for enhancing libido? Um, and do you have any sort of concerns about psychiatric or cardiac effects in terms of using a dopamine agonist? Um, when men take certain agents, antipsychotics, I guess you deal with that area and depressant agents, there was some of those agents cause the prolactin to rise. So it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a different type of hormone that prevents testosterone from working. And patients may have a normal testosterone level, but yet have all the uh, complaints of decreased libido and basically their erections not as being as good, they're not as happy. Mm -hmm. And if you find their prolactins elevated, sometimes you can use those agents to the benefit. Um, I probably seen about two dozen patients over the last 20 or 30 years that has benefited from that, but it's not like something everybody will respond to those. I don't really have any concerns when it comes to cardiac issues with that. I'm not familiar with that. There isn't any significant problems, but I do, I will touch, uh, if I can't find an obvious find when a person has a, a hormonal discrepancy, I don't have a problem with, uh, trying the, uh, t- testing them for, uh, prolactin deficiency of some type. And mm-hmm. if they do uh, definitely, mean, not deficiency, excess, right. but treating them with those type of patients. Sorry, my phone was ringing. I didn't understand what was going on here, but uh, that's okay. Yeah. You also mentioned premature uh, ejaculation, which, um, you know, especially in a younger uh, male population. Huge um, issue, huge issue. issue. What do you think, what do you think is causing, is it, do you think it's, it's more psychological? Is there something else going on? I, I... Well, I think part of it, is that uh, maybe it's the women's movement that a lot of women want to have their orgasms and uh, guys, a lot of times they get excited, especially young guys and they ejaculate too quickly. Mm -hmm. So the woman's disappointed. And I have patients that are sent in by their wives or their girlfriends. And they say, go get this fixed, go and see somebody, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a a normal variation. Some men may last nine or 10 minutes. Some men last a couple of minutes. Now, um, if they, sometimes they, ejaculate uh, 
there's some men who actually ejaculate before even entry into the uh, into the uh, female uh, vagina. Right. And I see these patients. A lot of them are very religious, and they have different upbringings to think about this. Right. <clears throat> but they come to me because they can't get their wife pregnant. Yeah. So that's a very unusual type of thing, but we basically use a condom that doesn't have any kind of spermatocidal gels in it. And we basically inseminate their wives. They get pregnant and they're all happy completely. But going to the other spectrum, when the women's women women want to have their orgasms, they want to have pleasure and uh, men want to deliver it. So they come to you and there's different agents that you can take centrally, I mean, orally Mm -hmm. or topically. And Mm -hmm. some of the topical agents are basically um, offshoots from lidocaine. So you desensitize superficially, you decrease the hypersensitive nerves that pick up and pass this whole reflex on Mm -hmm. the central agents. What we learned that were if you're in your area in psychiatry is that when men were put on high doses of uh, Zoloft or Paxil, basically they lost their erections completely. So what we found is if we put just a little bit on for a period of time, that uh, a lot of these men were able to double and triple the uh, IELT is inter, inter, intervatural ejaculatory length of time they have. And this was, it was, uh, it's beneficial. Unfortunately, a lot of those agents have some side effects, nausea once again, and uh, the erections don't work as well. Uh, one of the companies, Johnson & Johnson, was very involved in developing a very short acting um, agent. It, uh, it's called the Poxetine a number of years ago. And it was very unfortunate because right at the time that they were going to launch, they came out with a black box warning that the use of these agents, these all these antipsychotics they use for other reasons, that they're, they have an increased uh, incidence of uh, suicide. So this came as a black box warning and basically killed that, uh, that agent, but it was an oral agent that was uh, basically going through the FDA approval process and never made it. But I think that there are agents that can slow the ejaculatory process. We've learned them and um, um, we've learned more about this condition. And it's not just uh, some men legitimately have uh, shortened ejaculatory time and some men are fine, but they just want to be longer, you know? So uh, that's more of a recreational concept, but that's okay. As long as the agent doesn't cause side effects or doesn't cause harm, I think men can use these. This is modern medicine. We could use different agents to better one's lives. And I think as long as it's safe and it's efficacious, great. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess that's a common question. A lot of people have is like, how do you, how do you clinically diagnose or define premature ejaculation? Is there an, an average minutes? Is there an average threshold or is it much more subjective in terms of, is it causing? Well, they've done effect? actual, they've done stopwatch studies and they've done hundreds and thousands of men, different studies in Australia and in the United States and uh, Netherlands has a lot of studies and The International Society of Sexual Medicine, when I was like president and all these things there, we were working on that. We came up with a definition that's been sort of accepted. We said uh, one minute, uh, give or take a minute. So it means that two minutes is not really normal. But so for actual studies, we would look at those things and get stopwatch measurements. But if you take a whole group of men, probably the average is somewhere around four and a half minutes that most men have. And there's a spectrum. It's like what they do is they take 2000 men, they make a bell curve and they knock off the 5% on the lower limit and the 5% in the above limit. And you have a, you have like a 90 or a 95% confidence symbol. That's the normal area. And the mean is about four and a half minutes. But as I said, these, and, and then the other thing is men have to be distressed by it. Now you can understand there's different couples. For example, if a woman has dyspareunia where she has pain during intercourse, mm-hmm. if her husband can ejaculate in a minute, she's happy about that. She doesn't necessarily want him to last 20 minutes because it causes her pain. This is, so you have to individualize treatments and you've got to listen to their stories. And as right. William, William uh, Osler once said, he was from my alma mater, he said, listen to the patient. They'll tell you what the diagnosis is if you just spend some time. So sometimes you do all these complicated uh, algorithms and you do lab studies, but if you listen to the patient, sometimes it's very particular that how you can treat them. And sometimes you can't treat them because they're so mixed up what they're dealing with, but at least talk to them. And I think that's one of the things about you know sexual medicine is to talk to people what their problems are. And for example, a lot of men who are very upset about their erections not working, um, they live in, uh, and they're despondent because Mm -hmm. they have this problem or they have Peyronie's disease where they have a curvature. They may have a 90 degree curvature. They don't want to even have sex anymore with uh, their wives. Um, 
they don't want to go basically and find another partner. So they're kind of very depressed. Yeah. And uh, just to talk about it is really, really wonderful for them because they recognize they're not the only people in the world. So I recently had a reporter from, I think it was the New York Times or something. And he wrote an article. I didn't read it, but anyway, um, he was saying, you know, we're seeing all these art- these these advertisements on uh, TV about these curved fruits and all these things and Peroni's disease. Don't you think this is uh, terrible for for the, for the population. And I said, no, I don't think at all. It's just education. And once they learn about all of these potentials, if you have Peroni's disease and there's a potential treatment, other men have the same problem because a lot of these men, they suffer in silence. And right. interestingly enough, the average guy with Peroni's disease, when we did our original studies with Zyoflex, mm-hmm. they basically suffered in silence for about uh, four or five years before they came in. And yeah. it's unfortunate. So once you all of a sudden see that there's this condition and there's a potential treatment and there's websites now you can look at, unfortunately, a lot of them try to take advantage and they want to sell you something. But I'm just saying you learn about the little the condition they're, they're suffering from. It takes a load off a lot of people's mm-hmm. backs. And they, a lot of them, for example, they think that they may have a cancer there, but they yeah. ignore it. And once they learn this is just scar tissue yeah. and it's related to Dupuytren's contracture, which is a contracture of the hand. Um, it basically becomes knowledge that I think is important for people to know. So that's part of our job is to educate not only other physicians who don't know about this, but also the public. So uh, we're in a position that we can help people. And that's part of our oath that we have become medical doctors. Absolutely. What causes a scar tissue, by the way? Well, we don't know exactly. It may be uh, there's a genetic component, but it seems to be, micro trauma. And what happens is that um, probably the, the, the tissues aren't as resilient or elastic as they were. And when men have intercourse, they bend. And, and for example, as men get older, their erections aren't as stiff. So their penis may bend a little more. Right. So it causes micro bleeding in that area. And this starts a whole cascade. Mm-hmm. And normally what happens is the body basically clears that up and it heals, but some people have an imbalance when it comes to the healing process. So there's more deposition of inflammatory cells and when you have inflammation, scar develops after. So the muscle doesn't work. So they develop erectile dysfunction plus a curvature. So all these things go hand in hand, Um, but it's not everybody that has this. And unfortunately, a lot of primary care physicians were taught over the ages that if a man comes with Peyronie's disease, tell them to come back in a year or two because it's not dangerous and it'll probably go away. Now, the only, the truth of the matter is about 12%, it goes away. About 45% of people, it progresses to get worse. Uh, and then 40% of people, it stays how it is. Right. And one of the cardinal things that a lot of men, um, it, it has to do with their sense of well-being of being a man, but their penis shrinks in size. So mm-hmm. it gets smaller and shorter and they notice it. And the worst thing is when the wife agrees with that, you know, and, and the man feels terrible. So they come and see you and they said, my life's over. I, I, I can't perform. My wife doesn't want me anymore. I don't want to show this. So you can see that this, the whole psych, the psychological aspects, we call it uh, neuropsychology, but that goes hand in hand with this. So we deal with this. And I think one of the things, if you enlighten them, what you're dealing with and that a lot of like 4% of the, pop, the adult male population has Peyronie's disease. Yeah. And once they know this, this is like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's enlightenment in a way. Absolutely. But I think this is why it's so important to do these sort of podcasts because it's part of, you know, general education, putting this on YouTube. And so I, I don't think most people actually know what paper Peyronie's is unless they are part of that 4% or even if they have it to your point, they may think it's another condition in cancer. Um, so I, I think it's absolutely important. Um, and I, I think it's important, even like the, this, the research that you're citing, like for instance, uh, you know, the average, you know, sexual uh, uh, engagement rate is four and a half minutes. That's, that's something I learned today. Do you know what the, the, the 95 well, for the male, for the male, and that's, that doesn't include foreplay too. And all of yeah. the other aspects, you know, you got to buy flowers and things to that effect. Sure. But I'm just saying is that there's a lot of other issues. It's just not the actual sexual contact, but yeah, right. the ejaculatory time, that's the average. But true. Do you know what the, the 95 percentile range is? You mentioned oh, they go up to 60 minutes or something like that. Some people, okay. you know, yeah. I'm curious, some, some of the treatments that you mentioned for premature ejaculation, obviously you mentioned like the lidocaine, the, the numbing agents or wipes that some people may be familiar with. Obviously that's gonna reduce the sensitivity and, and make people last longer, but does that significantly also uh, uh, impair the enjoyment of sex, essentially if you're numbing your penis? 
Not really. Um, I think they still had a benefit from a lot of those things. The interesting thing is you've got to wipe it off after you put it on about 10 minutes before because the wife can, can, can lower her sensitivity too. Uh, generally speaking, now, when I was president of the International Society of Sexual Medicine, there are a couple of countries that what they do is they do uh, dorsal penile nerve ligation. They actually ligate the nerve so men become insensate in that area. And yeah. I think that's criminal because yeah. men should have some sensation, but the idea is that they're so hypersensitive, they take it away. So yeah. uh, we totally disagree with that, but it's done. I won't, well, two countries are Brazil and, and uh, South Korea. This is yeah. a common procedure that they do. We don't do it here in the United States, thank goodness. Yeah. But this is for young guys that are basically despondent. They come in and they have this procedure done. What, it comes with the, the lidocaine spray that it's available that you patients can buy over the counter um, right. is that their patients can spray anywhere between three and 10 sprays to get different levels. And they could figure out what's best for them. But obviously there's a titration where they learn what works best for that couple. So you have to learn. You don't want to become no sensation, obviously. Right. Nothing will happen. And you become, that's a, a a, a rare problem when you have delayed ejaculation in men, and we have to deal with that. That's usually uh, where I send them to a sex counselor or a psychologist. But likewise, when you have early ejaculation uh, or premature, as we'd like to call it, um, it can be helped by simple things like a topical agent or an oral agent. You mentioned oxytocin inhibitors. That was looked at. It wasn't a convincing significant improvement. And I, they abandoned those studies. This was about 10 years ago that we were looking at those things. But I think they're onto something. There are different agents. And when I have a lot of older men in their 80s, that um, they can't have, have, have orgasm anymore. Yeah. So we're looking at different agents and there are oxytocin passages and we try on these things. They don't work often on people. And the, and the drug that was used for, uh, I think it's the restless leg syndrome. I've used some of that and that worked maybe in 10% of patients that tried it, but uh, it's not really foolproof. So we're looking for agents, we're searching for them, but we're not there yet. I think we will find them in, in due course, but they're just not there. But this is a common problem. I have men coming yeah. in in their 70s and early 80s, and they they lose their erections. We put in a prosthesis in them. They have kind of erections, but no longer can they have orgasm. Yeah. And they're very frustrated by this. And sure. I've got millionaires that say, I'll pay you a million dollars if you can just give me my, my orgasm. I got my erection. And it's really an issue in older, in older guys. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I often, uh, especially with younger guys, where it's probably less likely to be an organic issue, you know, uh, talk with them about behavioral techniques uh, for premature ejaculation. Masters and Johnson has developed, um, you know, like a squeeze technique. Where squeeze you can, technique. Exactly. Right. Train essentially yourself or work with your partner to train to delay your orgasm, which actually works quite well. It takes a bit of practice and, and uh, repetition to do. And they heighten their sensitivity. They understand certain um, issues about it's signal, signals that come where, because for some guys, once they start moving off that plateau, they can't stop. So they've got to know. And this is the idea that they learn when it is to withdraw or to squeeze. Um, and it can work to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but you have to have a very uh, uh, complying partner also that understands this too. So it takes two to tangle a lot of times, but yes, there's no question there should be a combination of behavioral therapy and potentially use a medical therapy if you think it's indicated. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm increasingly seeing a lot of um, companies provide, uh, providing search early off-label, uh, which is an SSRI for premature ejaculation. I'm, I'm curious to you, your thoughts on that approach. Well, well, the only concern is that those are long-acting agents mm -hmm. and patients may get some side effects. Typically, those agents take about two weeks to have any efficacy. Patients have to take them for a while. Yeah. Um, Paxil is another one um, that I use prefer prefer uh, preferentially, Zoloft. Um, but, um, if they have side effects, if they stop, you don't want to stop that agent abruptly. You have mm -hmm. to sort of taper it. And if you have side effects, these can be a problem. And there's a withdrawal as episode mm -hmm. aspect of it. 
And uh, there's something called the serotonergic syndrome, where patients have all kinds of different side effects from too abruptly stopping these agents. So because they take so long to act, they're so slow acting, when you withdraw them, you can't just abruptly stop them. You've got to basically taper them off to not to have some of the side effects, like right. includes nausea, vomiting, and all these issues and instability of your blood pressure. Um, nothing you'll die from, but it's a miserable period of time. So that's why the only issue that I have uh, with those agents, I think you should prescribe them under medical guidance mm -hmm. and Perfect. at the lowest dose possible. And sometimes I've had some guys with recalcitrant uh, premature ejaculations where I've combined two agents. I'd start them on one Paxil and I will add Zoloft, both at the lowest dose. And it may work in some cases, but not all the time. Some of these guys just have real problems, but uh, I would go in certain circumstances to using two of those agents uh, as a combination. Right. Rarely. What about the opposite uh, in terms of um, guys who are having delayed orgasm or anorgasmia, um, as they call it? Um, I know one of the things we found is that sublingual oxytocin seems to uh, Im improve time to orgasm in those folks or actually enhance the um, strength of orgasm, interestingly. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if you, what treatment approaches you take there if someone's having trouble orgasming. Okay. Generally speaking, uh, a lot of those guys, they have abnormal masturbatory uh, mm. patterns when they're younger. Right. And um, a lot of these young guys get involved with pornography mm -hmm. and they're super stimulated. Right. And uh, they will, for example, go and rub on their, on their carpets and things like that. So they do these extreme things. So all of a sudden they meet a woman or they get married and it doesn't have the same stimulation, I guess, mentally and uh, physically. Mm -hmm. So they come to you and those patients, majority of them, I think they need sexual counseling yeah. or a uh, person who has a special knowledge of this area and mm -hmm. dealing with them. But along those lines, there's a couple of reports where these oxytocin uh, agents have been given sublingual and uh, and uh, intranasal, I think, too, but uh, right. I've tried them. And I know I would say that uh, one in six of the patients claim they respond to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I'm not against trying it. There's no danger to it. And the, the background is that when men uh, or even women, when they have orgasm, their oxytocin levels rise. Right. So that's why they think that if you increase the oxytocin, that may be a benefit to these patients. Mm -hmm. So that's the the mechanism or the concept that we're looking at here. Um, some of the compounding pharmacies have this available uh, relatively inexpensively. So I don't have any, any uh, with, uh, qualms about people trying this on patients, yeah. but I think generally it's not going to work as better, best as people think. And I think probably a behavioral or a psychologist who deals with this is probably the best route to help here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is to your point why a really good differential diagnosis and conceptualization is important. If it's if certainly if you if you have that history that you mentioned about excessive pornography, masturbation use, and you've, you've kind of desensitized yourself psychologically and physically, absolutely. And you got to deal with that. There's no uh, pharmacological, you know, thing that can that can necessarily, uh, uh, you know, address that versus you know, someone who maybe it, it could be secondary, ironically, to their SSR use that they're taking for depression and they're having delayed orgasms. So you got to have to understand the root cause. So interesting, um, having gone to a number of inter international meetings, and I think in this country, it's usually young males that mm -hmm. have the issue. And I don't know much about pornography. I'm not allowed to watch it in my house. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, I'm just saying is that there is a definite pathology with people that overconsume, and it's usually right. young males uh, in the United States. But when I was at an international conference, they have the same problem with females in South Korea, where they watch a lot of pornography, and they have the same kind of problem on the female side that we mm -hmm. have with the young males on the side. And, and it's just a, a fascinating thing when I heard this, and they were talking about these the same concept is that I guess visually or psychologically or mentally people have these incredible visions of right. what happens when an orgasm that stimulates them. And then just regular intercourse is not the same as what they were before. So 
the mind has, it's probably the biggest sex or, organ that uh, we know of, as, doc, as, as Dr. Freud once said. Yeah, but, uh, it's it's It probably has an influence very much. And that's why uh, counselors or people with knowledge in this area can be uh, a wealth of uh, benefit to many of these patients that have problems. Yeah. And I, I think in a lot of ways, just like drugs, um, you know, I think some pornography and other things are almost like digital drugs and the dose yeah. makes poison as pharmacologists like to say, I don't think there's something inherently bad about pornography, the, the moral uh, side uh, aside, same thing with mas masturbation. But uh, I think young, especially I'm seeing this a lot clinically and anecdotally, you know, younger folks are far overdoing essentially um, both of those things to, to a degree that starts to become pathological or to your point, you know, develop some of these problems. Um, segueing a little bit, I wanted to actually ask about your, you, you know, your thoughts on the relationship between hormones uh, and libido. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about testosterone, uh, and you know, um, if if one like, how much does testosterone influence uh, libido? Well, I think the studies are clear that uh, that the male hormone. First of all, we could. Talk we can talk about uh, testosterone for hours, but I think in a lot of ways, um, testosterone gets a, a bad rap because mm -hmm. people think that it works just on the sex organs. Right. We've got angiogen receptors throughout our body. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to your bones, your muscles, your kidneys, your liver, your skin, um, your brain. So mm -hmm. what they find is like, for example, elderly people, it's not going to make a person a genius or somebody who's demented, but it will help who make, make them get better again completely. But it will help certain things that's been documented, the ability to spatially recognize different things. There's certain that it's a clarity that can happen. So it's, I'm not saying that all people in, in convalescent homes should be put on testosterone, mm -hmm. but it's something to consider that mm -hmm. testosterone itself affects all of the organs of the body. Right. Now, a lot of men saw a number of advertisements that don't you want to be young again? And yeah, men and women too, they get tired in the afternoon and they see these young people and they wish they were young again. So for a while, I think that the um, pharma companies were advertising the use of testosterone just everywhere. And uh, when the, the feds looked at this, there was about, there's these testosterone shot shops where they just go pay 50 bucks and they get a shot of testosterone with the belief this is going to help them. And if they are low, yes, but 30% or 35% of these men never even had their testosterone checked. Mm -hmm. And this is the issue that a lot of these guys said, well, this is what I need, you know, and uh, no question about it. But we know that young men who basically are hypogonadal, it means they have lower testosterone levels. You replace their testosterone to a normal range a normal range is somewhere in the middle. It's, there's no absolute number. Um, and the range is usually three to 900 we use, but just it can be changed whatever assay you're using or what center you're using. But we know that their frequency of intercourse will increase. Their, their erections in the morning will wake up. They'll have uh, hard-ons mm -hmm. and that their fantasy uh, derived erections will improve. Uh, there's no question about it. They can, so it does help. There's no question when it comes to libido and yeah. the desire. and uh, But it's not a magical bullet that just because it'll make you superhuman uh, in super physiologic levels is probably not a good thing. Uh, if you look at those, I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, I've talked to some of the old NFL football players. Mm -hmm. They all took these steroids and things mm -hmm. and few of them live past 60, but they had testosterone levels. I've seen some of them, these uh, bodybuilders, mm -hmm. their testosterone levels are 3000. This right. is like 10 or 20 times higher than the normal levels. Right. And this can't be good for your body. And they're twitching and all that stuff. And yeah, they got huge muscles, but uh, it's just a little bit uh, kooky. So right. I'm against that stuff, but I think that you got to be very careful to basically be tested at least first of all. And if you're deficient, replace yeah. or supplement to the normal range. Yeah. And I think a lot of those patients will have improvement in their libido. 
And there are benefits, other things. For example, one of the, if you look at the guidelines or from the FDA and the, the, the labels, they say, oh, you worry about prostate cancer, you worry about your prostate growing and, and you're getting, uh, going to urinary retention. If anything, what we found was with uh, prostate growth, that there's probably an inflammatory component mm. uh, to the prostate enlarging. And basically, when you give this androgenic, not anabolic steroid, there's actually a diminishment in size of the prostate and men have actually have an improvement in the urinary symptoms. Mm -hmm. When it comes to prostate cancer, the jury's not out, but initially it was thought that um, prostate cancer was, if you gave them testosterone, this would be uh, adding fuel to the fire. Right. It doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It doesn't start prostate cancer like we knew it before. And there are some places, for example, Johns Hopkins has some very novel studies where they're actually giving at the time of treatment for metastatic prostate cancer, uh, testosterone to help it grow. And then basically uh, treating those patients with, with uh, chemotherapy in order to kill those cancer cells because they are raging. Yes, cancer cells do uh, rely initial cancer cells on a hormone basis, androgens to sort of help stimulate them. But if you take away the hormone, over time, you'll get basically hormone insensitive cancer cells growing, and that takes about two or three years. So you're basically castrate resistant at that point in time. But the jury's not out, and I don't think, to our knowledge right now in 2021, that we think that cancer, that prostate cancer is caused by testosterone, yeah. but metastatic prostate cancer can cause some of those cells to grow if they are uh, sensitive to it. Absolutely. So I, I think that ho hopefully allays some people's concerns about increasing testosterone's effects on the prostate. Um, what about um, a lot of people anecdotally hear that it's bad for the heart or that it causes cardiac issues to increase one's testosterone? Well, there was about three or four studies that came out maybe eight or 10 years ago that sort of said, wow, these guys, but these were very poorly designed studies. They're retrospective. They took uh, caseload studies. And then we looked carefully at some of these studies. They even included females in their, in their <laughs> group of patients. And uh, it was, it was horrendous what they did, but there's probably 50, there's done meta-analyses that have been done with 50 or so studies that showed that uh, if anything, testosterone is good for the heart, mm -hmm. not super high levels, but just sure. normal levels. And they show that men who have, uh, who are hypogonadal have low testosterone levels that they are usually sick and die earlier. And there are some studies, not great studies, that show that if you replace these men with testosterone, they don't die as quickly. Now, I'm not trying to say that uh, for mortality is, is, is seems to be beneficial, but I'm not trying to say that hypogonadal men, if you give them testosterone, they're gonna live longer. I don't wanna say that, but I do say that there's probably, it's a signal that the body is sick when the testosterone drops. Right. And, uh, you want to look obviously to other areas like patients have other comorbidities, like the common ones are diabetes or atherosclerosis or, you know, cardiovascular disease, all these things. But uh, testosterone itself is not a killer. It yeah. actually is beneficial to patients. So um, I tell what we're actually in a circumstance right now where the FDA uh, has put onto their label that you've got to inform patients that it's not, the jury's not out, but that there may be uh, increased evidence of uh, DVTs and um, uh, pulmonary embolism and cardiac deaths with uh, testosterone. I mention that to my patients, but it's, it's a rarity. And I think that if men have too low of a testosterone, there may be more benefits than risks in treating them. That's such a good point too, because I, I think people obviously, you know, as they should be, should be aware of the side effects of taking any sort of uh, medication, but they should also think about the opportunity cost and trade-off of, of being untreated and the side effects of that as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between testosterone replacement? I think a lot of folks may be familiar with TRT uh, versus testosterone restoration and taking a totally different approach using a CIRM or a selective yeah. estrogen receptor modulator? Well, the, the commonest one we know is Clomid, and it was developed about 50 years ago. I think it was 1975 or so. And it was developed for females to help them when they weren't ovulating properly. And it basically masks the receptor that the body thinks there's not enough uh, testosterone or estrogen around. Right. Style. And what happens is that the body is tricked into shoot, basically releasing 
from the anterior pituitary tuganonotropins, in particular um, follicle stimulating hormone or FSH or luteinizing hormone LH. And the FSH works on the serotonin cells and the sperm producing cells. And we use this to stimulate sperm production in men who have low FSH levels. Mm -hmm. And likewise, LH works on the Leydig cells in the testes to make testosterone. So we can if a patient does have inherently a low level of these gonadotropins, we can give these agents um, and cause the body to be tricked into making more uh, testosterone and sperm production. Um, and we've used this off-label for, I've used it for 30 years, and it really helps men have children, and it can help in certain circumstances. Now, one of the funny things, and I think you'll probably want to get into this, is that Clomid has two components. There's stereoisomers, and, and there's zooclomine and enclomaphene, uh, um, I guess right. it's called. Uh, the zooclomaphene um, stimulates estrogens and testosterone, mm -hmm. but the enclomaphene stimulates mostly just testosterone. So it's been put forth as an agent that can basically increase your testosterone level when it's given, a, given that part of Clomid is given to patients. Right. And that may be a benefit. Now, it's important to see if the patients do have a deficiency of LH and FSH and testosterone, not to give it you know, for no reason at all. And then to follow those patients to make sure that they're doing what they are. If they're not basically being stimulated enough, and we have certain lack of knowledge when it comes to the central nervous system, how different receptors work and all that. Mm -hmm. But some men need a higher dose. Some men need lower doses. And when I use Clomid, which can be, it's basically a generic agent, a little bit expensive, but you can buy it. I usually start them on the lowest possible dose because some people respond excessively. And if you right. increase the testosterone level in the body, what it does, it actually feeds back and closes off your whole uh, HPG loop and reduces the sperm production and your testosterone. So it, it, it works against itself. So right. I usually start on the lowest possible dose and then gradually increase. And I would think the enclomaphene would be the same idea that you would uh, start at a very low level and see what the response is after a period of time and then basically increase if need be right. uh, in these patients. And it may not be the total answer. I mentioned before yep. prolactin, and I'm not really that knowledgeable about thyroid stimulating hormones and all those things, but that is an area too that's kind of abstruse that we don't know exactly. There may be autoimmune things that are going on. I don't know exactly, but uh, all these things sort of have a constellation in that part of the brain that may have certain effects or ramifications on your bodily functions. What's that lowest dose that you're typically starting people on with Clomid? And Clomid comes as a tablet of 50 milligrams. Mm -hmm. So what I typically do with Clomid is I tell them to break the tablet in half and um, take 25 milligrams or half tablet every second day. Mm -hmm. And that's what I typically do. And that work comes from Christina Wang about maybe 30 years ago. She did in Hong Kong. Really good work that showed that patients that start on the full dose, that they produce too much testosterone that turns off the system. So you want to start at the low dose because some people are very sensitive. And typically, younger men are more right. sensitive than older men. And that just has to do with probably aging receptors are changed a little bit. So um, you got to be very careful about not overshooting the mark, what you're trying to do. Yeah. We, we found something very similar. So in, in our patient population, we're, we're using n the isomer that you mentioned. Um, we typically start folks out on 6.25 milligrams, mm -hmm. which in theory would be equivalent to about 10 milligrams of Clomid since uh, Clomid is about 62% in clomiphene, 38% zooclomiphene. But there's some interesting um, uh, research that I've read that it, it, it's, there really isn't actually a dose equivalent. I mean, clomiphene just seems to be much more potent um, even on a milligram by milligram basis, um, because it sort of lacks that zooclomiphene uh, uh, isomer that acts essentially as an estrogen agonist. I think one of our advisors, in fact, described clomid as almost like taking clomiphene plus an estrogen. Um, and so it's having sort of unique effects in the body and especially over time, because the half-life of the two isomers are totally different. Um, uh, and clomiphene's half-life is pretty short. It's like 10 hours, uh, uh, zooclomiphene lasts a very long time. And so over time, the zooclomiphene actually builds up in the system, um, versus the enclomiphene. But we, we type to the dosage anywhere from 3.125 milligrams, which is a very, very low dose for people who are very sensitive all the way up to 25 milligrams. 
uh, which is what, what's been used in the clinical trials. That's exactly with Clomid, same idea, yeah. Yeah, and per- people need different dosages, and obviously their results in the lab tests and their subjective symptoms um, will dictate what dosage that they need. I'm, I'm curious in your 30 years of clinical experience and taking sort of this testosterone restoration uh, approach using CIRMS, um, how, how well do people respond um, versus TRT? Because I think there's this prevalent notion out there, maybe it's influenced by the internet, that TRT is the only thing that meaningfully increases testosterone. It's the only thing that works. Everything else is inferior. But I, I think it may have been these clinics that have perpetuated this notion. Possibly. Yeah. The, um, the truth of the matter is that women need to have some androgens in their system in order for them to um, benefit from a sexual standpoint. And men need a little bit of estrogen. Right. So uh, what Clomid had with the zooclomiphene part of it, it increased the estradiol probably too high. So Mm -hmm. patients never got, basically they had a blunted uh, response. So I did have patients that, for example, came to me because they were they've been on testosterone for a while. And as I mentioned, you have testosterone. It turns off if you exogenously give testosterone, it turns off the system. So you your body doesn't make its own testosterone, and at the same time, doesn't make stimulate the sperm cells. So they actually drop their numbers. They become oligospermic and even azospermic in some cases if they take high levels of this. So we want to stimulate them. And a lot of these guys have been on testosterone for five or 10 years for bodybuilding for whatever reason, I don't know, but they've been put on from, they go to the, the, the gym and they talk about these agents and they all give themselves this right. and uh, yeah, they get great responses in their body, but at a certain consequence. Um, anyway, they come to me a lot of times because the wife wants to get pregnant and all that, and they have no sperm. So we try to stimulate them and the Clomid itself um, does work for some men, especially young men. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it, a lot of these guys, after they've had their child and they're happy, they want to go back to testosterone because there's a little bit of, when they have high levels of testosterone, I think there's a little euphoria with that. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say that it's not written in the textbooks and all that, but they, they like that little bit of high they get from it. And I think that, uh, the Clomid or the Enclomiphene will restore uh, physiologic normal levels, but the superphysiologic levels provide something else that works on receptors we don't know. Yeah. I think that's what's happening. A lot of these guys, yes, I do. Th- I do find maybe about 30 or 40% go back to their testosterone shots after because yeah. they, they, they claim that it's more of a, a benefit to them. I don't yeah. know. We have actually got an increasing number of XTRT users um, signing up for our protocol. Um, some of whom, for you, as you mentioned, want to do it because they want to restore their, their fertility if they want to have kids or they just don't like the idea of having shrunken testicles and the long-term, you know, shut down. I think there's increasingly folks that are um, uh, concerned. Actually, there's a good question for you in terms of when you take TRT or injectable testosterone, um, is there a down regulation in terms of some of those precursor hormones in terms of like pregnenolone and progesterone, which have uh, neurocognitive effects? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. I can't answer that question offhand. I have to look it up, but uh, um, probably I would think so. I don't really know. Yeah, I think this is kind of an emerging area that I think people are interested in. And I've seen some some doctors try to, you know, uh, almost top up the top of the funnel, I guess, so to speak, in terms of providing those as, su- as, as supplements in addition to that. I mean, I guess that's sort of the nice thing about, you know, using a serum like in Clomiphene is um, because it's still stimulating uh, luteinizing hormone and, and the natural production of testosterone. It's not shutting down any of the steroidal cascade from cholesterol down to, you know, testosterone. Um, well, you ask a very profound question. Do patients have neurocognitive changes mm-hmm. with those other things? And I really don't know if that's the case. I've never thought of that, but uh, I can't say no. I can't say yes. It's just yeah. un- un- undecided yet. Yeah. Um, it's something I hope to actually contribute to the literature. We're actually collecting data. And one of the interesting anecdotal um, findings that we found, because, because, you know, we use the QAdam and standard sort of uh, questionnaires that have been validated in terms of you know, what's the effect of obviously increasing someone's testosterone, um, particularly if they're starting out low. 
Um, but uh, we, 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 we added some psychological questionnaires as well, just given I'm a, you know, given my whole background. And interestingly, um, the majority of our, our patients report decreases in depression and anxiety. Interestingly, we're obviously not marketing or using it for psychiatric purposes, but there, there seems to be some mood alleviating, mood enhancing effects um, from enclomiphene or, or from the increase in testosterone that results from it, which is really interesting. And I wouldn't deny that. I would think that there is a benefit. Um, um, I wouldn't say it's a panacea that's going to help all sure. people with depression or severe depression. But if a person is truly hypogonadal or has an elevated prolactin, for example, from those, some of those agents, there's no question. I think that testosterone itself, if you bring it back to normal levels, normal levels, I say, but I think that would be benefit. Um, I also wanted to ask you about DHT, which I think is a very misunderstood <laughs> hormone. That's a derivative of, of testosterone. A lot of people ask about it because they're like, well, if I increase my testosterone, am I going to increase my DHT? Is that going to uh, 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 expand my prostate? Is it going to make all my hair fall out? Um, uh, and things of that nature is a common question we get asked. So I was, I was curious your, your view on, on DHT. Well, we know about DHT because finasteride came out a number of That's years right. ago. And um, finasteride, when you put a patient on for about six months, it'll decrease the prostate size by about 20%. So for a lot of men, it actually helps their symptoms and it delays any kind of surgical things. And interestingly enough, I have a lot of patients when they're on different agents for their lowering tract symptoms from BPH. And we tell him, we can do a surgical procedure. And he says, I mean, I don't have to take any more medicines. And I said, yeah, the patients don't know that. They, I think there's been a, sw a, sw uh, a transition in the last 20 or 30 years where we've moved away from simple surgical procedures to medications. And uh, I think there's place for both of them. But uh, you have mild symptoms, yes. But I have guys with 100-gram prostates. They're on agents that they probably should have surgery for rather than try to still eke out a little time, but uh, on a medication. But um, what also uh, was found is that these agents that all derived from actually a family in uh, Central America that they, they worked on. And these guys, they had, it's called the penis at 12. And I forget the Spanish translation was. Mm -hmm. And uh, Macaulay McGinglis, I think she was the person that wrote all about these things. And they found they had a deficiency of this, uh, that enzyme. And uh, what happened is that they, these patients, alpha reductase, right? Pardon? Five alpha alpha, reductase. Yeah, reductase and enzyme. But a lot of these males were brought up as females in the first dozen years. But by the time puberty comes, they have so much testosterone, they have testosterone peaks and they actually override this, this, this enzyme and they call it the penis at 12 syndrome or something like that. But interestingly enough, uh, what they found is low dose, finasteride um, works on causing hair growth. Mm -hmm. So the agent we know is Propecia. Right. And there seems to be a small group of patients, less than 1% that have what's called the post-finasteride syndrome. Right. And that's where they develop all kinds of sexual side effects. Mm -hmm. They become tired. They become low libido. We don't really know what's happening here. It probably involves the fact that these agents cross the central nervous system and there are certain aspects that glucocorticoids that work centrally, we don't know about. And it seems you have to have susceptible people. And a lot of the studies that have been done are actually poor. They basically have these uh, uh, clubs that they join on the internet. And they did try a class, class action suit about five or so years ago, which failed. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I see, I've seen probably a few patients a year with post finasteride syndrome and I do check their hormones. I do give them hormones. Uh, I mean, testosterone replacement therapy in these circumstances, some of them get better. Some of them don't. Some of my patients just over time, everything's resolved, but I think it obviously involves some tampering with the, the, um, Somehow the receptors are changed. I don't know uh, how I can explain it, but yeah. it's an unknown area. It's very interesting. And it's now, I think it's on the label that post finasteride syndrome in many different countries that this can result in young males. The funny thing is, it seems to be predominantly 
in younger males that take the one milligram dose and not in the older guys that are in their 60s that take the five milligram daily dose. Mm -hmm. So at the lower dose and the younger men, I think it's just a susceptible population that has this, but it does help hair growth. Right. And uh, I was once invited to the uh, hair restoration, international hair restoration uh, meeting. They had about 700 people there because for a lot of people to, ha to have your hair growing is very important. It's very masculine yeah. and all that, uh, all that biz. But when I sat with the, with the, all the directors, every one of them was on finasteride. They weren't disbelievers on this. So they, they really think that this is a, uh, a, a bona fide treatment for hair loss. Yeah. Um, so it works, but there is like in any agent, there are always side effects. you got to be recognized. Sure. The funny thing is that these guys, some of these guys would develop this post finasteride syndrome five years after taking it. And I've heard of patients that stopped it for seven years and then developed it after. So it's not really scientific when right. it comes to the cause and effect. We don't understand this completely. Yeah. The, the post finasteride syndrome aside, and there's debate about it. And the, as you mentioned, it is, it is a low frequency, fortunately. Um, although the, the people who have it do seem to have prolonged effects and very vocal complaints. Um, what do you think about just um, the effect that it has on most people, which is it, it will suppress your systemic DHT levels down to sub-physiological ranges. Now, DHT is apparently not necessary for muscle growth. So even if you have sub-physiological DHT. It's mostly like in the prostate. It's mostly located in the prostate, I think, DHT. I think that's where most of the receptors are. Um, but yeah, is there, is there any like concern or effect that you have about just suppressing your serum, essentially DHT levels? No, no, I don't think so. I'm not familiar with the, that topic really. Um, other organs that are affected by DHT being lowered, except for yeah. the prostate itself. I, I, no, I just bring it up because I've heard sort of anecdotally that, you know, DHT sure. is sometimes just described as the, the virility hormone and, and it may have some effects on um, you know, libido and drive and aggression and, and other sort of um, the more psychological sort of effects. Because I, I work with some uh, at the VA, I work with elderly males who have big prostates and I put them on DHT and we question them, but rarely do I hear any kind of those issues. Mm -hmm. And this may be a case where more younger men are affected and susceptible mm -hmm. individuals. But I know there's anecdotal cases, there's no question about that you're yeah. saying there, but I'm not really familiar with any bona fide um, literature that sort of suggests that. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I wish there's more literature. I think some of these things are kind of emerging from yeah. clinicians like yourself or anecdotally in, in, the, uh, and, in the world. And so, more, and sometimes more you learn things from your patients. They, you work in the trenches and they tell you things that are not basically in the product label mm -hmm. or at presentations and patients tell you sometimes. And that's what I find the beauty of clinical medicine and dealing with patients because you learn a lot from them. Yeah, absolutely. One, one last question uh, for you, since you've been very generous with your time, what, what, what is, uh, what do you see for the future in terms of hormone optimization or, or are there any particular, you know, treatments or topics that you're particularly excited about? Well, that's a, a wide ranging question. Uh -huh. I think the big changes relate to your company is that <clears throat> I think that there is a certain segment of the population that are very actively involved with their own health care. They want to know things. <clears throat> They're very attuned. They are trying to learn about these things um, and they support it. Uh, I guess the biggest drawback is probably the majority of people are ignorant and they have no knowledge. They don't want to learn anything about something. So they don't really care. So there are a certain segment of the population that would basically be dealing with any kind of knowledge about these things. So I guess in my position as an educator, mm -hmm. I would want more of the population to read about and learn about their own body functions and how we can improve it, be it diet, mm -hmm. be it supplementation, uh, exercise. We've learned this right now. So right. like, for example, smoking is bad for you. <laughs> Just like fossil fuels are probably not good for the planet. But, you know, a lot of times it takes years of these things to people to realize that. But I just hope that there'll be more widespread appreciation of the importance when it comes to your own body, when it comes to what you take and what makes it go because you want to live a quality life. Yeah. And I'm so glad you bring that up. Um, obviously, as a, you know, behavioral psychologist, we, we always talk about health behavior change. 
And so as part of our protocol, not only do we provide medications and supplements, we actually do health coaching and making sure that people are optimizing their diet, exercise, sleep, focus, uh, and using sort of group-based social accountability uh, to do so, because I think it's critical, uh, especially if your goal is not just to increase testosterone, but to improve how you feel and you function, making sure you're getting adequate sleep and making sure that your lifestyle is not suppressing your testosterone due to lifestyle factors, I think is absolutely critical. Um, and I very much agree on the educational front. That's why we're so glad to have you on the podcast and sharing your education. I think a lot of folks have probably never seen a urologist in their life um, until they have a problem. And so I think being able to, you know, share the incredible decades of wisdom that you've had uh, with the general public uh, does a, a long way towards achieving that mission. So thank you so much for joining us. I will today. say that every man will need a urologist at one point in his Great life. Point. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for Thanks the Thanks a lot, Cam. It's been a pleasure being here. Absolutely.